Thank you all so much. Um, can we give another round of applause for our amazing panelists? <laughs> very, very powerful. Very powerful work that you all are doing. It's really a privilege to be able to have this panel discussion with you all. Um, so we can go ahead and dive in, get a little bit deeper into health equity in practice. And my first question is about strength-based research. A couple of you mentioned that in your presentations. We know that the communities we're speaking about and even representing on this stage today have been oppressed for centuries, to just be frank. Um, so many health disparities have come out of our oppression, unfortunately. And we know these disparities exist because we see it in the research in addition to living it. However, I like the fact that you all have done something a little bit different. You've adopted something called strength-based research and approach. So I just want to take some time to kind of define that and give some examples of what it looks like for that to be applied on the communities that you serve. So Elise, if we could start with you. Sure. Um, strength-based um, research and strength-based approaches are critical for the campaigns that we do each and every day. Uh, we have an amazing team um, that uses data uh, to measure the campaigns over time. Um, but it's really about looking at the strengths of the community uh, first and applying practical application to those, um, to those groups. Got it. Esther, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think it's really important to note that equity is about two things, simply two things, which is a transfer of resources and a transfer of power. And if I think about um, strengths-based approaches, like for example, in American Indian Alaska Native communities, we have high rates of binge drinking. But we also have mm -hmm. hi the highest rates of abstinence for our youth. So you have to tell the full story, right? Mm -hmm. And that is where, um, it, that, that's what it means to be strengths-based, is to tell the full story of your community. Mm, that's so good, because there's mm -hmm. so much power in you know, telling our stories. I picked it up from every one of you that identity is major mm -hmm. when we're talking about equity. Yeah. And the only, the only way we can truly get to know who we are is by telling our entire story. So mm -hmm. I love that. Um, yeah, so to move to our next question, um, Dr. Graham, I'm gonna come to you for this one about uh, trauma-informed practices. So obviously we've talked a lot about mm -hmm. trauma today. It's hard to separate ourselves from trauma when it's you know, deeply ingrained into who we are. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about how urgent and important is it for the public health sector to um, adopt trauma-informed practices? Oh and then what does it look like you know, for those policies to be implemented? I mean, it's, I mean, it's incredibly urgent. Um, I really do think we need to be doing more of this. Because I mean, I mean, there's organi amazing organizations like uh, Esther's who are already doing this inc incredible, incredibly important work to uh, address trauma in our communities, um, and of course by uplifting them and by uplifting sovereignty and and, and power. Mm -hmm. But we do need more of that. We need this at higher scales. Trauma, especially that historical intergenerational trauma, is it weighs heavy and it, it builds up over time, and. Um, I think healthcare systems will feel that. They do feel that uh, because trauma makes people sick. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's fairly urgent. That's, that's basically what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Anybody want to add to that? Um, I feel like I've been talking a lot, but oh, yes. just yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I spoke a lot to, about trauma-informed systems of care, but like I said, I think it's equally as important to move beyond that trauma, right? Um, you know, it's funny when you talk with our youth, they don't have the same relationships. I'll, I'll use the alcohol as a, another example, again, as an example. They don't have that same connection, right? So we have like an older generation, like our boomers, who are like abstinence only. And we think about things like medically assisted treatment, and they're resistant to that, right? Replacing one drug with another is some, sometimes how they define it. Or even in our cultural community, it's like really cautious against that. And can you participate in ceremony if you're replacing one drug with another, right? And so I think about those things, and, and that is how trauma plays out. And so you have to be able to address like these multi-generational experiences of, of trauma and, and build within our communities um, to, to meet the needs of everyone, right? 
And, and so, I don't know, I, I just think that it, that requires like uh, intergenerational interaction, sharing mm -hmm. our stories, like recognizing the trauma from our stories and then healing from that by reclaiming them, right? Mm -hmm. And just, um, and making it different. Yeah, I love that. that. That factor of healing is so important. So I kind of want to talk about that a little bit, you know, in the communities that you serve um, at the Seattle Indian Health Board, you all have taken a approach to kind of um, care for the entire man, you know what I mean? Because that is something that is so uh, close to the native community. Can you talk about what has been the impact of applying such an approach where you are looking at the entire person, the mind, the body, the soul, the spirit? Sure. First of all, I'll tell you our community will tell you that uh, this is not my vision. It's not our leadership vision that we were called here to do this work. Mm -hmm. And basically our ancestors is moving, are, are moving through us, working through us. We're here to implement this system. So what it feels like is when you come into our organization, you're gonna smell medicine in the air. And that medicine is gonna spark that blood memory, right? That mm -hmm. connection. You're going to hear, you're gonna have an opportunity to see other native faces and you're gonna have an opportunity to speak your language and you're gonna have an opportunity to do all of those things. And each of those moments is about healing, right? My kid who, uh, you know, he's, the way he moves through the world, he presents really fair and he presents white, quite frankly. And he has the heart of a drummer. And his songs come to him already and he knows that he can go to drum circle at the health board, right? He can um, experience aunties because he's not from my tribe. He's Leech Lake Band Ojibwe. And, he, and they teach him his creation stories. That happens just in community setting. Mm -hmm. That is healing. That is multi-generational healing. And mm -hmm. that is power. And so when you imagine in the future, right, let's say we've actually come to a place of equity um, for Indian mm -hmm. folks who are living in urban communities, what does that look like? What would you know, your son's children um, ideally have access to when equity is present? Yeah. Well, since we're in a public health room, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> it reminds me of like what Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, right? When they said, well, how many women is going to be enough on the Supreme Court? And she said, when it's all of them. <laughs> and that's how I feel, right? <laughs> that when everybody, regardless of where you are, recognizes that you are a guest on this land and you begin to behave that way. Mm -hmm. That you don't give us some token seat on a task force or a focus group but that you are truly doing meaningful work with community. I love it, thank you. That's what it looks like. I love it. Elise, I wanna to come to you, if that's okay. Um, you mentioned in your presentation, you brought up something that is very sensitive to the black community, which um, is the Tuskegee syphilis study or experiment. You know, there are different ways that we uh, communicate mm. about that. Can you talk about what was the outcome you know what I mean, of the, uh, the ad that you all put together, the campaign, what type of response did you get um, from the black community mm -hmm. after that? Yeah, well, I mean, in a, in a, through the actual process, um, the team was very intentional about um, holding focus groups and meeting with the uh, families that were impacted, both directly um, and indirectly. Uh, and the feedback overall was very positive. People, uh, the black community and, and, the, and the individuals that were impacted um, by the studies um, were, were, were very gracious in their time and very appreciative that we took the time to sh shed a spotlight on what happened um, so that people can know more about the history. Uh, and I think, you know, as we're doing this work, we have to be really mindful of the images that we're portraying and the stories that we're sharing um, so that we can have a balance, right? I mean, everything in black history is not rooted in slavery. Everything, you know, there, there's a powerful um, story um, to tell that should be holistic in nature. Uh, so I just want to make sure that as we're all doing this work together that we really make sure that we are telling a complete story um, of individuals and communities. Absolutely, that's very, very important. And
And something that comes to me, because you mentioned in your presentation how important empathy is. So I would just love to talk about the process of prioritizing empathy. You know, when you all are putting together um, these, these campaigns, what does that look like uh, typically? Listening, holding space for yourself to reflect on the, uh, the, the campaign, um, extending grace to others as they're sharing their stories in a vulnerable way, uh, being present, you know, the gift of time is like no other, right? So I think it's really important um, as we're doing this work that we are holding space for all of those things and making sure that you're in an environment that allows you to tell your full story. And if you're not, it's not the right environment. So, you know, we want to make sure that as we're doing, doing this work and creating these amazing campaigns that are really people's lives and stories, that we treat that with care and, and empathy. I love that. Y'all are making me so excited for the future <laughs> because it sounds amazing to be able to sit in rooms with people like yourself and know that the person you're sitting across has considered your entire person, you know, is, is prioritizing mm -hmm. empathy and, you know, having an understanding of their positioning um, when it comes to this research. So Dr. Gray, I'm gonna come over to you now because um, I wanna know more about positioning, as you mentioned in your presentation, understanding that this work is not all about objectivity, but it is about mm -hmm. understanding who you are and what your responsibility is. So can you talk from a personal standpoint how do you measure your positioning, you know, when you're doing this work? And, and what has been the response of the people that you're serving when you're coming to them from that empathetic posture? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know if I've ever thought about how I measure my position. Um, what I do know is that when I come to interviews, focus groups, people feel really comfortable. Um, and they'll let me know that they're comfortable and they'll let me know that they enjoyed our conversation. And I think a lot of it is because I approach it as very much a conversation. Like if I were outside of a research context, it's, a, it's like a dialogue. And so um, I think a lot of that for me comes from, I guess, not really feeling that I'm um, special in any way. Um, a, a guest, as I, I should put it, I love that. Um, it's a privilege to be able to talk to a lot of these people and get to know their stories. Um, of course, granted that because they're the ones that are there, I'm like I'm the researcher and everything. I'm, I have a PhD or I'm, I'm an ex, some kind of defined expert. Of course, there's that power dynamic I, I have to be conscious of. And that's the thing. I don't feel like it takes me much effort because as long as you're approaching people with that, like love, just seeing them as people. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it, it comes kind of natural to me. I don't think it's anything that I, I thought about that much more than I needed to. Got it. Well, thank you all so much. I think we're coming to the end of our time, but I want to leave a moment for final words. Anything you would like to share, um, you would love to leave our audience with. Elise, we can start with you. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Um, you know, this, it's really a privilege to do this work. And, and you know, at the, the Ad Council, we work really closely with change agents and champions and communities. And we do this with a level of responsibility that's required to advance this work in a really intentional and thoughtful way. And I want to make sure that people understand the role that they play in this process to advance this work. I think it's really important to ask permission, you know, for communities. Anytime we release any information, mm -hmm. reports, data, stories, anything, we ask permission first and make sure that we provide our community with the resources they need to move through healing. You know, sharing stories of trauma, working on solutions, you know, we have to do that together because it's not 
us and them, it's all of us. Mm -hmm. um, wow, I have to follow that. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think just to kind of reiterate the same points I made, which is there's just so much you can gain from just really trying to see people um, and see beyond yourself. I think that's essentially what it boils down to. Positionality, see beyond yourself. Empathy, see people for who they are, or at least make the attempt. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you so much.